This is Jeff Denworth. Uh, thanks everybody for joining today's webinar on containers. Um, our engineering team likes to say that, at least from a news perspective, we got the, uh, the highest press release and uh, news article to code ratio in the history of the company on this one. So it's definitely a hot topic and um, we look forward to helping you all understand a little bit about what we're doing in this space and why it's important to us. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm Jeff. Um, oops. I run products for Vast, manage, uh, Vast Data, and, um, and with me today is my co-presenter, uh, a gentleman by the name of Andy Pernsteiner, who is our field CTO. So, I'll be going over the concepts um, and, and why we think we're, we've got a cool thing for containers, and Andy will be taking us through uh, a demo. Andy, you there? Just making sure you're all mic'd up and ready to go. I am here. Okay, thanks for joining. Okay, so um, so a quick recap of that, who Vast is. If you're joining and you just want to learn about container storage and you don't know anything about Vast, um, our, our mission is fairly simple. It's to kill the hard drive. Um, and we do that through uh, a number of different things, but um, but but the ultimate objective is to essentially become an extinction level event for mechanical media uh, in the data center, uh, and we're 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 quickly marching towards that objective. Um, the 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 value proposition for us, uh, in particular with containers, is what we believe to be radically compelling flash economics, uh, economics that bring us in line with what people today otherwise spend for archival storage. A level of um, scale uh, with a file and object storage system that is, um, that is extremely large. Imagine an exabyte scale distributed storage system that you can apply to a lot of different applications in particular when you can start to build sub millisecond latency into response times for these protocols. You start to be able to use them in ways that you haven't in the past. Um, and the scalability allows you to consolidate lots of different applications and lots of different um, data sets all into one platform. And from a container perspective, what we're talking about today is basically direct attach levels of uh, container performance, um, even though we're talking about a shared and network attached storage system. And at the same time, being able to provide levels of quality of service for demanding applications that you would have within a large container grid that, um, that allows for the, the consolidation of a bunch of applications into one platform without concerning yourselves with the, the performance implications of that. And so um, the, the product that we offer is what we call universal storage. We think it defies categorization. Um, it's built on a, uh, a new collection of technologies that um, we, we started working with back when we started the company in 2016, uh, and they've assembled into a, a new type of storage architecture that we call a disaggregated and shared everything architecture that combines um, a new storage protocol called NVMe over fabrics with very low cost, but also low endurance flash, um, QLC flash, uh, that we solve around and, and basically engineered a system to deliver 10 years of longevity for flash devices that a lot of the other storage players in the marketplace can't use. And one of the ways that we make this usable is with a new type of persistent memory that we've built the platform on called 3D Crosspoint. And so what you have here is a scalable disaggregated architecture where the servers um, are running the logic of the system, the enclosures hold the state of the system. Um, we're talking about containers today. VAS has been working with containers since its inception. Everything that we write is, with, is in Docker. Uh, and you can think about these container servers as one part protocol server, one part global flash controller, uh, and you can scale these servers independently of the enclosures to build very large namespaces um, where you can get to better levels of efficiency, resilience, um, and uh, scalability than what's been possible in the past. And we won't have time to cover all of this today, so I would encourage you to go look at some of our other materials or watch some of our other webinars. But this is the general principle. And um, the way that we, we crack the economic nut is by um, implementing a few innovations that, that haven't been done before in uh, data infrastructure. 
Uh, the first is we've, we've built a new global flash translation that's possible because of this shared everything concept. Um, where our flash management essentially extracts about 20 times more endurance from very low endurance flash drives than what other systems will realize. And that makes it possible, uh, combining that with the level of scale that we deliver to, to essentially support all of your applications and deploy a system that can be fielded for 10 years uh, using a cost of goods that's much lower than what our, our competitors have to use. The second um, objective we made for ourselves was to essentially give customers back more free space for the infrastructure they invest in. And that related to our work around erasure codes, where we sought to break a trade-off that's always existed between the amount of overhead you have to pay for and the resilience that you should expect for your cluster. And in our case, we've implemented a new type of what we call locally decodable codes um, that uh, get the uh, resilience down to about two and a half percent overhead, but at the same time, we're talking about like 60 million years of mean time to data loss. So that can save us up to another 66 percent as compared to, in that case, uh, triplication based architectures, and that compounds with the savings that we get from QLC Flash. Uh, and then finally, we have a new, um, very innovative approach to data reduction. Uh, and the analogy that you can think of here is that. If you were able to, to globally compress all of your data, if you were able to just zip up your whole namespace into one large zip file, that's roughly the equivalence of what we're doing. Um, our approach has all of the benefits of deduplication because our method goes um, entirely across your namespace, but the pattern matching looks a lot more like uh, local compression because we're, we're matching um, patterns within as little as one byte granularity. And so, um, this new approach is capable of finding reduction opportunities where people had previously thought there may be none. Um, we're finding a lot of opportunities to reduce down things like unstructured data, even compressed unstru unstructured data. Um, and um, if you're already benefiting from data reduction systems that you're buying today, uh, we've made a guarantee that you'll only see much better reduction from us or we'll pay the difference uh, in free storage. So. Um, so these three things compound to basically level a new um, economic equation for all flash infrastructure that makes it possible for the first time to deploy all of your data on flash. Uh, and as a result, um, we're, we're, we're seeing just a groundswell of customer adoption that has never been witnessed before in the storage industry. Uh, as we close out 2019, um, Vast holds the distinction of being uh, up to date up to date, the, the fastest growing storage company in history. And you know it's all propelled by this value proposition of if you can afford flash for everything and you can make your infrastructure a lot simpler, uh, A, the, the pains of mechanical media go away, but B, a lot of the same underlying arguments for storage tiering also go away where you can imagine building your data centers of the future from one tier of scalable, low cost, and very fast flash. So, um, Thanks for the advertisement. Uh, now it's time to kind of pay attention because we're talking about containers again, and um, let's get into it. So uh, it's it's no surprise that containers are are really um, hot space right now. Uh, if you look in a lot of the largest cloud data centers, you'll find that uh, con containerized workloads are are quickly overtaking um, virtualized workloads, and um, there are container vendors and container monitoring vendors out there that are now managing the uptake of containers in the order of billions of containers that are being deployed ac across the world right now. Um, and the, the drivers for this are simple. Um, one is um, containers enable a new level of automation because it's basically infrastructure as code designed for the ground up with a very API centric model. Um, from an infrastructure perspective, it's also more efficient. Uh, a, you don't have to instantiate a bunch of different operating systems within a containerized server. You just uh, create little, um, little pods uh, that, that use resources more efficiently. Container um, software infrastructure is readily available and a lot of people use open source. And containers ultimately are becoming more and more of an abstraction away from the infrastructure level altogether, where as customers start to build what they would consider to be cloud native or refactor their applications into cloud native um, uh, form, 
what you have is the ability to very easily move containers back and forth between on-premises uh, and public cloud infrastructure. So uh, the same Kubernetes that you could deploy, let's say in your data center, you can easily move to, uh, to Google or Amazon or places like this. So, um, so containers are, are becoming a critical element of, of customers' hybrid cloud uh, and, and full cloud deployment modalities. And, um, and of course, you know, this is a, uh, an important entry point for us. Now, so talking about VAST, why, why are we working with containers? Well, the first thing is that, you know, as, as we launched the company, we had this, this notion of what we call universal storage. Um, and, and the path to being truly universal has to include storage volumes. Uh, and, and of course, um, you, in this case, you have things like virtual machines and you have containers. Um, our read on it is that the, the virtual machine storage market has, has less storage pain because there's just so many incumbent storage companies that have been solving this problem for some time versus containers, which is a relatively new thing, which uh, a lot of the, the legacy players don't really know what to do with very well. Um, the other consideration is, as you think about VAST, we make very scalable infrastructure. And these next generation workloads that are being refactored to go cloud native also um, are oftentimes being challenged to make a lot more and better use of data. So these workloads become very data centric and that marries really well to this, this universal storage infrastructure concept that we have where um, you have all of your data in very, very high speed infrastructure. So uh, we sit at the intersection of performance and capacity and oftentimes containerized workloads meet us there. Um, then there's the other consideration, which is just that uh, the container storage interface was a lot easier for us to develop than uh, the VMware hooks that you need to go into that market. So, um, so we started with containers, but the, the biggest reason is that our customers have been asking for it. And um, we now have a lot of customers that are deploying our infrastructure in containerized workloads and, and they helped us um, understand what we needed to do to develop this first product that we're offering. So, um, so when we talk about containers and we talk about the interface to storage, the, the term that's used is uh, called a CSI. For those of you that don't know what a CSI is, you can think of it as uh, the term is container storage interface. And it's basically an initiative to, to unify the presentation of storage across different uh, container orchestration platforms out in the market to make it easy to dynamically provision persistent volumes from pretty much any range of storage products. Um, whereas the, the market originally kind of emerged um, as a, as with containers being talked about as, as stateless microservers, uh, as time goes on, people are realizing that you can just deploy containers for so much more. So stateful uh, storage is really important. And um, so the, the, the open source community has really gotten together and started to define a common set of APIs to deploy and provision storage. And, and the CSI is the, the result of that. So today it's supported by Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, there are some laggards that have yet to support CSI. Uh, Mesos is one of these, Docker Swarm, um, Cloud Foundry isn't there yet, but we're hopeful that they will get there. And um, the way that you can think about it, if you've got you know, VMware uh, expertise or if you've got experience with VMware, um, you know, in, the, in the VMware model, you have these EXS hosts that have their own um, uh, data stores that are typically provisioned using some of the VMware APIs via vSphere. In the case of K Kubernetes and other uh, container orchestration platforms, essentially, as opposed to hosts, you have these notions of nodes and um, the CSI driver is um, intended to uh, essentially create and deploy the policies around persistent volumes uh, via the Kubernetes master. And so why would you use uh, something like NFS for containers when um, a lot of customers have experience just building direct attached uh, or iSCSI attached block storage for this environment? Well. The first consideration is that, you know, the, the nice thing about NAS is that you get infinite elastic scalability of the volumes that you create. Uh, there is no practical limit to the, to the size of the volume that you can create with VAST. Uh, and as a result, um, that allows you to kind of future-proof the, the volumes that you wanted to, to provision for your containers because you don't worry about, um, like, you know, the boundaries of what you have in your machine or the boundaries that, of what you can create with, a, let's say, like an iSCSI lung. The second consideration is that 
Um, <clears throat> NFS as a, as a container persistent volume option allows you to, uh, to mount pre-existing persistent volumes as opposed to something like the, the scratch utility called empty dir. So, um, so now you can essentially pre-populate data into a, 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 a persistent volume via a, a container as opposed to having to start creating data uniquely. Uh, and then of course, um, NFS allows for shared writers to access a volume simultaneously. And, and VAST, of course, has um, byte range locking capability. So to marry to the needs of container environments, um, the, the basic capabilities that we have are uh, a dynamic provisioner that we're offering now um, that has support for setting things like uh, storage class and quota policies. And then as we add more granular snapshots to the system and, and replication, you'll be able to easily provision those via policy um, in the future. And that will be out this year. But there are some things that we do for the container market that are um, a little bit non-standard. And um, we think that these provide some advantage for customers that don't think that they can see these capabilities with legacy NFS systems. And the first of these is support for NFS over RDMA. So um, VAST for some time has been shipping in an RDMA server. Uh, we have seen upwards of uh, an Ethernet environment more than a 350% a performance boost versus implementing over top of TCP. Um, and the, the thing is that a lot of customers think that you need to have an InfiniBand environment in order to implement RDMA connections, where the reality is that you don't need really any of that. Um, you do need Mellanox NICs in your container, um, your container hosts, but aside from that, um, the only thing that's required on an Ethernet network is support for ECN or congestion control. Um, and if you can get there, then you can see performance levels that essentially are about 90% of uh, NIC uh, utilization. Uh, and then with multiple mount points, which we see oftentimes with GPU servers, and if you look, for example, inside a DGX system from NVIDIA, you'll find that these platforms are built to be container native out of the gate. And so you can essentially assign a mount point per each container. Um, and we've seen with just a few mount points that you can see well over 20 gigabytes a second for a single machine. And once you get there, what you have is vastly better performance than what you could get with a direct attached presentation of storage that you'd otherwise have with some DAS or, or with, uh, and, it's, and it's of course much better than what you get with a legacy NFS system. The nice thing about moving away from DAS is, of course, you get the, the benefits of shared storage and efficiency by making that move. Now, one of the other capabilities that, that we make as part of our, um, our CSI is the ability to assign policies based upon pool boundaries. Um, and why is this interesting? Well, you know, VAST has this disaggregated and shared everything concept with respect to our cluster architecture. And what it means is that Every CPU that runs our logic has um, equal and direct access to all the state in the system such that none of the CPUs in the vast cluster talk to each other at all in the synchronous write or read path. And so as you start to think about building up multi-tenant infrastructure where you've got a lot of applications that would otherwise compete with each other, VAST has this architecture that uniquely allows customers to essentially provision pools of VAST servers into resource groups um, that essentially can brute force quality of service by assigning a, a limited IP address range to that pool. And so you can establish multiple pools within a cluster, and these pools can be each allocated to different applications or different users based upon the mount options that you set. Uh, and the nice thing about that is that once you're there, uh, essentially every application that's operating within its own pool doesn't even know about the existence of any other application within an environment. So it's a really good way to, to segment activity that's going on within your data center. But at the same time, all of these applications can work from one common data store, one common data storage infrastructure. It's not like you have to build silos of infrastructure to support them. So it's the best of both worlds, guaranteed quality of service and shared infrastructure. Uh, and that's something that you can provision via the CSI. So if you, if you want to read more about um, this capability, you can go to our knowledge base. Um, we have a, a VAST with Kubernetes uh, overview and how to provision it. Um, you can also just go to Docker Hub and uh, pull our, our CSI 
uh, today. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Andy, and he's going to walk you through a little bit about what we've done uh, at the system level. So, Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. Can you see my screen? Yep. Great. Uh, I don't make slides, so these don't look great. But what I want to explain is the environment that we're going to demonstrate today. Uh, what I have is a quad server chassis where I have four Linux servers, each of which is running CentOS 7.7, um, each of which is participating as a Kubernetes worker node. Um, they are attached to a pair of 100 gigabit switches. They're actually from Mellanox as well, um, which are then connected to all of the components that Jeff had explained previously. Uh, so on the left, we have eight VAST servers. Uh, those act as the front ends for our file system. And we have two vast enclosures, uh, which contain the flash and Optane and persistent storage class memory that we mentioned earlier as well. So what I'll do um, instead of showing you slides is I'll give you a quick little intro to the environment from a different perspective. Um, so basically what we have is I have two windows open. The top half window I'll be interactively typing things and the bottom half window will be updating. Um, I've already set up Kubernetes on this cluster in advance because I didn't want to spend the time on it today. Um, basically, right now we have a relatively vanilla setup. Uh, I'm using Calico for networking, and there are no other containers running. Uh, I haven't set up any storage classes. I haven't done any container storage uh, configuration at all. Uh, so just to, to show you what we have in terms of hosts, I'll go ahead and give you a sense on what we have. Uh, there's four separate Linux machines, each of which are running CentOS 7.7. There's a number of prerequisites installed on here. I won't go through all of them. Um, you're probably familiar with those if you've done this before. Um, in the lower half, we can see a list of all of the pods that are running. Um, so we see a number of them. They're spread out across a number of the nodes, if you look over there on the right. Um, but right now, there's nothing running that's interesting yet. We haven't run any applications. We haven't attached any storage, anything like that. Um, in addition, what I've done is I've mounted uh, on this particular machine, a vast uh, storage system. Um, it's got approximately 1.1 petabytes worth of capacity available. Right now, I haven't put anything into it. So there's a mount point that we're going to be using today. Um, and if you notice right now, it's empty. I'll do a DU on that directory also. And you'll see there's nothing in there. As Jeff mentioned earlier, we, uh, we allow customers to use NFS over RDMA to accelerate performance for their applications. Uh, I'll be demonstrating that today as well. Um, but it's not necessary to use NFS over RDMA to work with BAST. You can use any uh, NFS client, uh, regardless of whether they have RDMA extensions or not. So the next thing I'll do is I'll go ahead and pull down the Docker uh, release. But first, let me just kind of walk you really quickly through that piece of it. Uh, I know that it was in the presentation. Um, it's pretty simple, right? All of the instructions are here. Uh, you don't really need to do much in terms of configuration. I'll walk you through all of that. Um, and it's all publicly available. There's also a knowledge base article that we have available, which explains some of the nuances to go into de detail about what we did behind the scenes. Um, but the intention here is that you can get up and running in a matter of a couple minutes. So I'll go ahead and do a Docker pull to pull down the CSI image. Um, I downloaded it in advance just in case my network was going to be slow. And so once we have it downloaded, uh, it's just a matter of running a command to basically generate a template file. Um, and so doing this will create a wizard. And once that wizard runs, we can enter in some details. Um, from a configuration standpoint, the, the most amount of work there is is pasting in the path and name of the container. We don't need to pull it. Uh, we've already been pulling it. Um, in this case, where it says vast management host name, I'm going to put in the IP address or host name of, a, uh, of the vast management system, which is basically the UI and API front end to our cluster. Um, before I do that, though, I'll kind of give you a brief walkthrough of what that means. So in this web browser, we can see the vast management system. Um, there's an IP address at the top that we're going to use today. This is the main dashboard for our cluster. It's also the API endpoint for if you're using the CSI plugin or if you're writing your own RESTful APIs to do any type of storage provisioning, monitoring, that sort of thing. Um, right now, this system's set up such that it has a 
pair of IP address pools. As Jeff mentioned earlier, we have the option of separating um, into different pools the vast servers that are included with the system. Right now I have two pools. One of them has four of the uh, vast servers in it, and then the other one has all of them in it, just to kind of give you a sense on the, the ability to mix and match those things. Um, we also have the ability to create quotas. I'll show you that in a moment as well. Right now I have a quota for some other work that I was doing on here, but we're gonna show how the CSI driver is able to create those as well automatically. Um, and the last thing I'll show you is we have a number of exports. Uh, we've been doing some other testing on here. Um, today I'm gonna be focusing on the RDMA export. An export, for those of you who aren't informed, is basically just a way to share out a file system using NFS. You can create as many as you want on the VAST cluster. You can create them at any directory level. Um, you can create them with different permissions and different attributes um, as you see fit. So I'll pop back over here. And to put in the VAST host name, I'll just put in the IP address since it's uh, simpler for me to do that than it's put in a host name right now. Um, and basically, it's going to prompt you for a login. I'm going to use the administrative one. And I'm going to put an administrative password. Once I do that, it, it's able to discover using the RESTful API on the back end, uh, the ability to list things like the VIP pools, like the export names, that sort of thing. Uh, today, I'm going to use VIP pool one. And then I'm going to go and specify which NFS mount point I want to use. Um, once I do that, I can also specify some additional NFS mount options. And so, as we mentioned earlier, we support NFS over RDMA. And because the clients that I'm running on also happen to have uh, Mellanox network interface cards, I can use RDMA as an option. So I'll go ahead and drop in the RDMA option here. Again, it's pretty simple. Beyond that, um, I've, done, I've done almost no configuration. I basically just specified a few relatively minor details and once I've done that, it creates a vast CSI deployment YAML file. I'll go ahead and open that up real quick just so you can see what it looks like. Um, it's relatively long, but effectively it goes into all the specification for what's required to get things set up um, for, from a storage container standpoint. I also have a number of uh, YAML files in here that, that are specifications for pods and applications that we built, um, but I'll show you those in a moment. So once we do that, all we really have to do is apply it. Um, and so once you apply the YAML file, it's gonna go ahead and deploy those containers on the rest of the cluster. Um, so if we give it a moment or two, it should be able to um, see if this updates at the bottom here. Momentarily, we should be able to get it to show that it's deploying these across the cluster. And then we'll be able to give you a sense on what that looks like. Ah, my bottom window's not updating. I'm gonna go ahead and not use that window anymore. Uh, so basically now we can see that there are a number of containers or pods started which are related to the VAST CSI. And so since those are started, we can now deploy applications and they will use, um, they will use that as well. So I'll go ahead and open up one of the applications. Um, it's just basically one that I, I created last night. Um, the, the only difference you have to, to understand is that there's there's a few attributes that matter. Um, so basically the storage class name is gonna be specific to the CSI container uh, initiative that we built. Um, in this case, it's going to make a request for storage. So you can allocate as much storage as you want for a particular pod or application. In this case, I'm using 10 terabytes because I felt like having a lot. Um, what that'll actually end up doing is creating a quota on the vast cluster. And within that, within that RDMA amount point that I specified earlier, uh, the rest of this is mostly generic. Uh, what I will say though, is that the shared volume is gonna be shared between all of the different uh, containers that it launched as part of this pod spec. So I'm using eight replicas, which means we're gonna launch eight different instances of this, of this pod. And that way, once it's running, we'll, we should see that all eight of them will run and they should be able to share storage um, and be able to read and write data to it. So I'll go ahead and apply that one. And once we do that, we'll go ahead and uh, look back at this so we can see if it updates. Okay, you can see at the very top here, 
it's starting to create a container. Um, this usually takes a few seconds. And once it creates it, it, uh, it starts to run. And then it moves on to create the next one. Again, this is all relatively straightforward for those of you that are familiar with Kubernetes. Um, as it starts to run, I've uh, the application that I built is going to generate a little bit of IO. And the intention is that way you'd see something in the UI, because otherwise UI is pretty boring. Um, so what it's doing right now is I'm running a series of containers which are doing IO to the storage system of VAST. Um, right now it's starting to ramp up, so it'll, it'll start off a little bit slow and then it'll get a little bit faster. But basically it's doing FIO, which is the synthetic load generator. It's doing random reads and writes to data. Um, this is all new data because there was no data in that directory before. Um, just to show you what that looks like, again, we'll go back over here. We can see now that we have seven of these containers or eight of these containers running. Um, so everything is running at this point. I'm going to go and do that du command again so you guys can see that there's now data in that directory. So earlier it was empty. Now there's data in there. Let's go take a look really quick. And we can see that there is a persistent volume uh, that has been created and it has a claim uh, for the pod that we've, we've set up. And then within that, we have a number of directories, one for each host name. It's not really a host name again within Kubernetes, but each of the application instances gets its own directory because I've decided to have it create one for every single one. Uh, and within those, if we run the find command, we'll see there's a number of files that have been created. And if we go back over to our UI on the right hand side, uh, we can see that there's still IO happening. I'm going to go and switch to a different view, which is going to give you guys uh, a view to see that the vast storage is aware of these clients hitting the system. Um, right now, it only shows three of them. The other one's probably warming up. And then if we go back over to the configuration panel that we were on previously, we can also see that it's been creating other elements. So uh, earlier, we talked about quotas. So if I click on the quotas tab, now we can see that there is a quota that's been created approximately uh, 11 terabytes for this application to use. And so far it's used about 687 gigabytes. Um, so this way when you're provisioning applications on a vast storage cluster, you can allocate a certain amount of storage, you can allocate a certain virtual address pool, as we mentioned earlier, to give it a certain uh, grouping of our vast servers. And so you can constrain both the amount of space that they take up as well as fence off any performance effects they may have on other applications that might be running. Um, and so basically, that's, that's the demo. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, again, it's all on Docker Hub. You can pull it yourself. Um, of course, it would only work with a vast storage cluster. Um, but we're very happy to have this included in our product at this point. Thank you, Andy. Um, oh, there was a hand raised. Not allowed to talk. Hey, Kieran. You are permitted to talk according to the way Zoom works. So feel free to unmute yourself. Actually, I'll unmute you. Hey, Kieran, you're there. Doesn't look like we can get you there. Um, okay. Well, uh, anybody else have any questions? Karen, you can write into the uh, the chat utility if you can't get the uh, the mic to work. Okay, uh, Andy, I'm going to take the the screen over and just. Um, Close it out by just summarizing what we talked about today. Um, trying to kill the hard drive, we can do that by redefining flash economics. Uh, it's a platform that marries well with what people are doing with modern applications. Um, scalable file and object storage with uh, performance levels that are equivalent to what you would get with direct attached to SSDs and quality of service controls that allow you to really consolidate everybody onto one platform. Um, okay, any other questions? Great. Uh, somebody came in and, and just made a comment that it gets even better when we can talk about uh, DR and HA across multiple clusters. I won't 
tell you everything that we're doing, but uh, you can expect some exciting news from us later this year. With that, I'll thank everybody for your time. Um, this is a, an important release for us because it, it's a big step forward in our mission of being truly universal, trying to build one system that you can use for all of your applications. And now we can add container volumes to that list of applications that we support from a storage level. And uh, if you have more questions, please, please feel free to visit us at vastdata.com. Okay, thanks so much. Talk soon.